this whole back area would have a, a third set of seats. You'd look out the back window, you know, you know, giving uh, giving uh, the nose to people riding behind you if you're a bratty little kid. Hey, Steve Miani here doing a junkyard crawl at Bernardston Auto Wrecking in Bernardston, Massachusetts with a 1973 Chrysler Town and Country. Now, a couple things about 1973. Final year for this styling cycle, which was known as the fuselage body. 1969, first year, 73, final year. Fuselage refers to the way that the side of it kind of tumbles home, as they say, from the front, kind of looks the roundness of an airplane fuselage. Pretty graceful in its day, but 73 was also the year of the infamous OPEC oil crisis, where the, well, the, the countries that produced oil and imported it or exported it to the United States decided to turn off the spigot for a while to teach Uncle Sam a lesson. Uh, but with that said, sales of Chrysler full-size models still increased 15% over 1972. So even though there was a fuel crunch and big thirsty cars like this were very hard to sell, they still sold. In fact, 20,040 town and country wagons were built in 1973. Now, don't confuse the town and country with a Chrysler Newport or a New Yorker. Those are strictly sedans and hardtops. Town and country means wagon. Now, of course, wagons like this were the vehicles that moved American families to soccer games, to Christmas parties, whatever it was. There are no SUVs back in this period of time like we have today, the minivan, that whole thing. Uh, wagons like this did most of the heavy liftings. Yeah, there were Chevy Suburbans and stuff like that, but largely American families had station wagons. Now, here's the thing. Town and countries were strictly big block powered. Standard motor in this thing would have been a 400 two-barrel, optional 400 four-barrel, or on this one here, the 440. Now we know it's a 440 because there's a T in the fifth spot of the VIN, which means 440 power. Although at this point in time, 180 horsepower, but there's that T in the fifth spot if it's visible. And again, that tells us that this was born with a 440 single exhaust, uh, thermoquad plastic four barrel carburetor, 180 horsepower, but again, something like 300 foot pounds of torque. So plenty to get this thing out of its own way. Uh, now the problem with that 440 is that it made this car a target long ago for somebody who wanted to grab that 440, put it into a Dodge Dart or a Plymouth Duster and make a, a big block A body. So that engine is long gone. That's one of the problems. When you see a town and country, about half the time there's a 440 in it. So, you know, the engine goes, the car's still good. But the thing is, this one here has the automatic, they all did, the Chrysler Torque Flight, but in a 440 wagon like this, that's a premium 727. It has a four pinion planetary instead of the three pinion. Uh, not the five, like a Hemi car, but again, that's a heavy duty 727. You could rebuild that thing, put a full manual valve body in that. It'll handle 600 horsepower, no problem. But again, this has been removed of its uh, radiator. That's long gone. This was an air conditioning car. We can see remains of that. Here's the cruise control right here, which would have uh, kept the thing running at uh, 55 uh, miles per hour. Keep in mind, 73 actually was still three years away from the 55 mile per hour federal speed limit on state highways. But again, it was on its way because again, OPEC was our first oil shock when we realized that big thirsty cars just weren't the future. Now here's the thing. Uh, there's a fellow named Dave Wise, a friend of mine from Barrett Jackson and otherwise. And Dave Wise runs a thing called MMC Detroit. This book right here is, this is his field guide for Mopars. Don't get fooled, bring this guide with you. And the beauty of this book right here is that this thing tells you anything you might want to know about just about any Mopar built during the muscle car era and even thereafter. You know, information on uh, colors for engines, paints, fonts. But on this one here, let's take a look at the trim tag and decode it using Dave's book. Now we see right here, E85, we go to the E page and that tells us, yeah, that's the 440. Right here is E85. Uh, of course, it doesn't show right here, but E85 is the 440 engine. Uh, next to it is D34, ABCD, D34 tells us the torque flight transmission. There's the torque flight transmission. Um, let's go with A16, we go up to the top of this thing, and it's cool, it's all alphabetical, which is the cool thing. A16, that is a code that tells us it has Fury 3 Spring Special. Okay, that must be a, a trim package that uh, is, is universally used, A16. Let's try another one. Uh, let's see, R48, what does that tell us? But again, the beauty of these Mopars is decoding them. A lot of fun in uh, getting the uh, getting the facts of the matter, but R48, EFG, again, the QR. PQR48, and next page, R48, power antenna. 
right there. So again, you can use this book right here and pretty much decode anything and everything you see on this. Now, we, one thing we do see on this is the VIN says CP45. That tells, this is a six passenger wagon. If that said CP46, it would be a nine passenger wagon. More on that in a moment. And as we make our way around, we see here in 1973 again, uh, Insurance companies were really pressuring Detroit automakers to make their cars less damageable in impacts. And believe it or not, bumperettes and extensions like this were band-aids along the way to the impact absorbing bumpers. So these kind of unsightly things were federally mandated crash things. I don't know what they would ever do in a crash, but they were lip service to impending rules that were getting stricter and stricter. Now this one here is pretty cool. These wheels, as a wagon, these are 15 by seven inch steel wheels. And the amount of offset we see right here, these wheels look really good, like on a Roadrunner or something like that. And on wagons specifically, these are seven inches wide. On lesser cars, they're generally five and a half to six inches. But if you want a 15 by seven, you want a station wagon wheel. And that's one of them right there. Cool stuff. And here's the power antenna we just saw a moment ago on that code, town and country. This thing last registered in 1992. March of 1992. Now we look inside this one, we see a, a big bench up front, of course, a bench in the back, three and three is six. If this was a nine passenger with that CP46 VIN, there would be a third row of seats in the back of this thing. And of course, this is always going to have an automatic, no manual transmissions in Chrysler's like this, uh, you know, after what, 1965 or six, I think it was. But again, this is something pretty cool on the back of this thing here. This has that we'll trade places here, Shane, and you'll get a kick out of this. Uh, the tailgate on this thing <clears throat> is of course the business end of any station wagon. And we can see right here that uh, it has steps to get to the top to load things onto the roof rack and also a deflector, this thing right here, that actually allows air to blow through here and keep the rear window clean. That's actually a little vent area right there. And also, if you're riding in the back of this thing, this helps to prevent exhaust gases from finding their way in, which is kind of a problem with third row seating on any station wagon, as a lot of American families learn. Well, not the hard way, but uh, they learned. Okay, now here's the beauty. Dual action tailgate, you can do this with it, and you get full access to that massive interior. And again, the third row of seats would have lived down inside of this void and they faced rearward, believe it or not. You would actually face back. This whole back area would have a, a third set of seats. You'd look out the back window, you know, you know giving, uh, giving uh, the nose to people riding behind you if you're a bratty little kid. But if you close the door and then pull this here from door to gate, this little latch, it's broken, but this thing here, you pull it like that from door to gate. Then what happens is this thing becomes a tailgate that comes up or down. And here are the hinges for that. In fact, this is a 1972, one year earlier, Chrysler uh, dealer brochure with all the models. And here is the page on the town and country. And again, this is 72. So this is a year before this 73, but you get the idea, big, long, low, wide. It says town and country, the complete wagon. New looks make it so with no, make it so with loop type front bumper surrounding dual horizontal headlights, simulated wood, new standard engine, 400 cubic inch V8, et cetera, et cetera. And on the next page, they show you the dual action. There it is on the right. And you can see right there how the door comes down as a tailgate or a door, depending on how you manipulate that switch. And the circle showing this, the picture on the bottom left, that is the air deflector. And we see the words for that. Chrysler's highly functional roof air deflector is standard. When you order town and country with an optional vinyl roof, the air deflector is color keyed to match the roof. So something for everyone in the uh, Chrysler town and country. Now, 1974 would bring something unusual to Chrysler, the optional 360 small block. Now, after the fuel shock of 1973, the 400 and the 440 with their maybe 14 miles per gallon on a highway, maybe 16. A lot of people realized, hey, that's just too thirsty. In fact, Chrysler realized that. So the 360 became a no cost option for 74 full size Chrysler like this. And fuel economy maybe went up two miles per gallon. Power went down about 15 units. But again, as we entered the smog 70s horsepower really took a second place to clean emissions and of course fuel economy. Now this of course being a station wagon weighs a lot more 
than any hardtop or sedan ever would. And of course, this has an eight and three quarter rear axle. Uh, there's a possibility this has a limited slip differential. In fact, if we decoded the, the trim tag up front, we would see an option code. I think it was D31, I think it is, for the limited slip differential. I didn't look to see it, but there's a possibility this thing actually has a, an eight and three quarter sure grip. 323 gears, if it's a trailer towing car, or maybe a 294 for a lesser. I don't see a trailer hitch, so it's probably got the 294 highway gears. Again, when you have a trailer towing package on a car like this, you usually get a slightly higher or a lower gear ratio, I should say higher numeric 323 to better pull that trailer off the line and just down the road. Uh, so again, this is a Big Chrysler Town & Country, a name that first appeared in 1964 on the full-size Chrysler wagons. Uh, also seen in earlier wood-sided vehicles, Chrysler's from the late 1940s. The Town & Country name is an old one, a legendary name in Chrysler land, and they applied it to the wagons uh, right through the, uh, the 60s and into the 70s. Now this one, sadly, being a Town & Country, it became a target for somebody out there who now has a Dodge Dart or a Plymouth Duster, or maybe a Roadrunner that has a 440 under the hood, thanks to this car. The rest of this car is going to sit here at Burnson Auto Wrecking and well, it'll be here tomorrow and hopefully you will be too. We'll be back tomorrow with more from the Burnson Auto Wrecking as we do the Junkyard Crawl. And if you like this video, be sure to subscribe to the Steve Mag's YouTube channel. Hit that bell so that every day you get an update and a, a, an alert that we have a new video. But the new videos come no matter what and we'll see you tomorrow.